Okay, good evening. Welcome to More Orthodoxy. This is a channel dedicated to bring in Orthodox Christianity, small o, Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox alike, to people who might not be familiar with those terms. So today I'm joined by Dr. Jared Casey. Dr. Casey is Professor Emeritus at UCD in Dublin. He has background in law and in philosophy with a law degree from the University of London and a primary degree in philosophy from Co University College Cork. He's also been involved with the University of Notre Dame and uh, the Catholic University of America in the States, whether as a student or as a professor. So he has released a, mo a book recently about the Me Too movement named after Me Too, came out just last month. Uh, but, oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is only the most recent in uh, an array of excellent books, which I'd like to discuss today. One of those books is Freedom's Progress, which I have strategically placed behind me. You might see just the outline over my left shoulder. <laughs> so Freedom's Progress, I wanted to ask, because this is a huge book. It's almost a thousand pages, is that right? Yeah, 900, well, 964, but who's counting? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that. What motivated you to write such a huge book? And who do you uh, hope Insanity? Is it <laughs> Actually, no, Mark, to be serious, I... You know, in the, in the story, Uncle Tom's Cabin, mm -hmm. uh, the... What's her name? I can't remember one of the characters. I think it's called Topsy. And after some time, somebody remarks, on her side, and she said, Topsy just growed. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, a, this is a kind of project that just kind of growed. Um, it began actually in 2013 when um, I was on a, on a visit to the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, and I met up with Tom Woods, the eminent uh, author, um, uh, Tom Woods, and we, he hired a car and we drove down from from uh, the airport uh, to Auburn, and he made me an offer I couldn't refuse, which was to uh, to do a series of lectures um, on political the history of political philosophy for his uh, university Liberty Classroom. So I did, and that's available obviously to people who are signed up to the classroom. But um, I obviously had the text of those and. And I kind of added and I developed material that I had already had and expanded and then I included new chapters and and then just kind of growed. <laughs> okay. And eventually it reached the ridiculous length that it is. And you know what? And this is going to sound like some kind of inverted boasting. Um, when I look at it now, I think, crikey, there are quite a few people I should have dealt with that aren't in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my publisher resolutely refused to have a book of more than a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. So it is what it is. As I say in scripture, called scripsy, scripsy. What I've written, I have written. <laughs> so there it is. Yeah. So as I said, it, it took almost four years. Um, and it was fun for me because, you know, I don't know what your experience is, but many of us have read some books from cover to cover we perhaps think we've read some books which we actually haven't right okay and we've kind of half read other books yeah so this gave me the opportunity and indeed required me uh to make sure that i'd read all the stuff that i was supposed to be talking about and to so i was reacquainted with material i knew fully acquainted with material i kind of half knew and and first-hand acquainted with material that i knew as a rabbi repute and uh, so from my point of view at least it was kind of, it was, um, it was fun to do. And I know it sounds ridiculous to say this, but I learned a lot writing it. <laughs> mm. And who would be, uh, well, just one or two of those key people that you feel now that you left out that you should have? Oh, gosh. Well, there's so many. And, and uh, people who have bought the book and said, why did you write about that? I can't think of anybody offhand now because there's so many people in it. I'm embarrassed to say if I mentioned a name, it would probably turn out to be somebody I'd actually written about. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah. So it's, um, you know, some people say things like, I could never read that from cover to cover. And I said, well, you obviously haven't read my introduction because in my introduction, I say, you know, why would you want to do that? 
that's kind of insane unless you're some kind of intellectual masochist. <laughs> um, so what I do in the introduction is I provide a kind of a route through the book for people who want to, you know, to, to tackle what's in there. But first of all, anybody can, I said it's not a penitential exercise. Anybody can read anything they want. In a sense, the chapters are, to some extent, are, are almost completely independent of each other. Um, um, and therefore, you can pick the book up anywhere and start anywhere if it comes to that. But that being said, it kind of, if you're reading a history of any kind, it does make sense to kind of follow a rough chronological order. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that being said, you know, um, this is, if a book on the history of freedom isn't Liberty Hall, I don't know what is. <laughs> Read whatever you like as much as, uh, and as little. So I expect some people to use it as a, as a kind of a resource. Um, you know, if they're writing stuff or thinking about a particular author, they can go to it. Um, and other people can, you know, uh, just browse. So I think one of the things, I know you didn't ask me this, so I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> one of the things that I think is sort of distinctive about this history, because there are many histories, is first of all, it's focused. So it's focused on the development of one particular idea, that is the idea of freedom. Okay, uh, so when I when I'm reading a philosopher, uh, a political philosopher, I'm interested in everything they say, but I'm particularly interested and focused on what they have to say about freedom. And my claim is, the question mark in the title is very important, because I'm not saying that freedom necessarily progresses. I think what we have is we have progress and we have regress and so on. And it's an open question whether, in some areas we've made progress, in other areas we've gone backwards. Um, and so that's the focus. Uh, and also, one of the things that I discovered when I was teaching philosophy, uh, especially political philosophy, was that students really didn't know a lot of history. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, it's important for many reasons, but it's particularly important for this reason, which is, if you're a libertarian as I am, and libertarianism is so far away from the political reality we have today, it's really difficult for students to imagine it as a real possibility. But then I say, well, hang on a second, let's go back 400 years and let's think about the way the world was 400 years ago in the year 1620. Every political order was governed by a monarch of some kind. None of that's true today. I know we still have a few kings, but they're nominal. Okay, the Queen of England doesn't rule. Queen of the UK rather doesn't rule, okay? And, and therefore, to people in 1620, the situation we have today would have been practically unimaginable. And I say, well, if that's the case, think about it. What's, why, we don't know what the world is gonna be like in 400 years time or 200 years time, you don't know. So the idea of introducing the history was to, as it were, uh, loosen the grip of what I called presentism. Presentism being the doctrine that not only are things the way they are, which is manifestly true, but they must be this way. Okay, and that's in a sense why I've, I've written uh, on the book. So yeah, that's it really. Um, okay, if we'd sold a few more copies, I could retire to the Bahamas on the strength of the proceeds, but you know, funnily enough, not too many people are willing to shell out the money <laughs> to read a 964 page book. So there we are. So that sort of ties me in with my next question, which is regarding our present stage, as it were, um, and your career in universities, what mm. sort of views of freedom do the students typically come in with? I'm not sure that many of them have fixed views on it. Um, one of the things I found, and and one and one of the reasons why I taught my my the last module I, I taught, taught, which is on anarchy law and the state, I usually began by saying to the students, um, I want you to begin by carrying out a kind of intellectual inventory of where you stand on these issues. And then I said, I'm going to try and persuade you in this course of the truth of the libertarian approach. But said so the, the principle of, but where you end up is entirely your business, it's not mine. <laughs> okay. But, and I said, you could in fact end up holding exactly the same views at the end of the course as you did at the start. But if you did, but didn't do it because you knew full well what those views entailed, what the opposing views were, 
what the arguments were on the various sides, then I would have failed. So, and I also said, uh, I, I'm, I'm asking you to take this course seriously, not just in the sense of something you have to do to pass an exam, but really to ask yourself, where do I stand on these issues? Because I said, if you're not prepared to do it now, when were you planning to do it? When you're 50? Okay, why not do it now? Okay, so take a stand. In other words, say, ask yourself, what do I think? And um, so that was really the, the function of the kind of course was to, to try and uh, push students to ask themselves those really sort of hard questions. And I found, uh, and then this may come as a shock to the more cynical among my colleagues and even to myself, I tend to be a cynic by kind of known nature, that the students by and large were, I found them relatively open-minded and willing to entertain. That's not to say they didn't give me a hard time and arguments and, and so forth, but they didn't you know, form a solid phalanx and sort of attack me en masse. So, um, and it was fun and I had people in there from different backgrounds. I, I almost always had a contingent of students who belonged to the Socialist Workers Party. For some reason, I exercised a strange fascination <laughs> for those people, I don't know why. And it was, um, you know, it, uh, they, I found they were some of the best because they obviously had very firm views on many issues. In fact, if, if you don't mind me saying so, when I, when I taught a version of this a, a, at the master's level, I had a student who was a very active member of the Socialist Workers' Party. I mean, you know, out on the street, handing out leaflets, talking to people, that sort of thing. You know, not just theoretical, but, yeah. but you know, card carrying. And he came, he took the course, determined to uh, show me the error of my ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, what happened is he, he became a libertarian and in fact went on to write a PhD thesis with me on the subject. <laughs> Well, there we are. Okay. I'm sure there were probably an equal, if maybe not a greater number of people who went away fully convinced that I was crazy and, and so on. But who knows? <laughs> well, one key facet that I'm interested in now that has really blown up recently is around free speech. Um, yeah. Especially around personalities like Jordan Peterson and that infamous interview which you mentioned in After yes. Me Too and with <laughs> Kathy Newman. And, <laughs> I'm curious why you think free speech is so fundamental and how does that um, differ from those people who might consider it a form of violence, for example? Okay, a number of issues in that one. First of all, free speech is important because unless you can speak freely and indeed others can speak freely, how are you supposed to learn? Okay, free speech here means obviously not just speaking orally, but also writing. Okay, doing videos and so on, expressing your views. And, um, you know, th this topic is well rehearsed at this stage. Uh, John Stuart Mill wrote his book on liberty in the middle of the 19th century, and which is in many ways a bad book, but on the issue of uh, free speech, he's absolutely right. In other words, the only way you can discover what the truth is here is by saying what you think and having other people interact with you. And unless your ideas are tested, and so on, You're, you tend to live in a bubble, uh, a reinforcing bubble, where you associate with people who share the same views that you do. You're never challenged. You're never forced to think. By the way, that's true. I mean, this is not a peculiar to people on the left or right of the, the sort of spectrum. It tends to be true of people generally. We tend to associate with people who share uh, our views and so on. And, and it's hardly surprising because it's comfortable. But particularly in education, it's important that your views, whatever they might be, uh, are actually tested and that you're challenged to defend them because only by doing so do you know whether they're really your views to begin with. Maybe they're not, maybe you just inherited them, okay? And then and you begin to know their weaknesses but also their strengths. And to some extent, uh, if, if we live in a world where there's free speech, then you, we're in an environment where you can actually take possession, it's going to sound strange, but take possession of your views so that they become not just a reflection of your environment or your parents or your culture or whatever it might be, but they really are yours. They allow you to grow as an individual and to take responsibility for what you, what you believe. And that I think is vitally important. I, I know I'm going to get that sound very serious now compared to what I've been saying, but you know, I, I, I do really think that that's absolutely vital. 
And if we don't have free speech, um, then we can't have that. Mm -hmm. right? Now, on the other point about violence, of course, look, um, <laughs> there is a difference in kind between somebody punching you in the nose and calling you an idiot. <laughs> Both of them hurt, I would imagine. But the punch in the nose hurts in a certain distinctive physical way, all right? Being called an idiot hurts psychologically, right? And it's true. But if, if being called rude names is violence, and it's violence in a metaphorical sense, right? Another, and, and if you want to use it in a metaphorical sense, I don't care. But there's always a danger when you start using a language metaphorically that we forget that it's metaphorical and then we think it as it were literally. So, so language, okay, by itself is not necessarily violent. Now, there are exceptions to this, okay? And the common law, for example, has always recognized that. So um, in the old common law tradition, there was a, you could be charged with assault and battery. You, are you familiar with those terms? That was very common. Now, what's the difference between assault and battery? Well, battery is, occurred when somebody actually hit you over the head with an iron bar. Okay, that's battery, or punched you in the face. Yeah. And of course, and you say, well, well, isn't that assault? And the answer is no, not necessarily, because assault is somebody's coming towards you, okay, with actions or with speech which would cause any reasonable person to apprehend the imminent application, as it were, of force. Right? Now, what does that mean? If, so if I, if I come up, if, you know, if, so, if a total stranger comes up to you, in the, you know, at night in the dark and says, give me your wallet or I'm going to stab you with my knife, mm -hmm. even if they don't touch you, that's assault, right? Because you, you reasonably believe that you are about to be assaulted if you don't do as they say. So the interesting thing is you can be assaulted without being battered, right? And also you can be battered without being assaulted. So somebody can come up behind you with the iron bar, you don't even know they're there. Right? So it's kind of curious. So very often, of course, the two went together. So somebody would assault you first by threatening you with violence and then would actually batter you. So you got both. Now, um, so in that sense, am I defending that? No, because that's a criminal offense. But, I, but that's because it is intended to, uh, to it's, it's an act of aggression. And of course, the key principle for, for me, as you, as you I'm sure well know, because I'm a libertarian, is the zero aggression principle, which is you're not allowed to, to uh, threaten, okay, uh, action which is violent towards another person. Okay, you're not allowed to do it or you're not allowed to threaten it. And in that case, yeah, it's, it's not allowed. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, you can say rude things about people. You can comment on the, on the, the strange color of their hair. You can make rude remarks about their religion if you choose to do so. And by the way, somebody might think, well, what kind of world would we live in if people started doing that? And my point is that, well, the law is not the only means by which we regulate our conduct, right? In fact, much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is determined by social conditioning and good manners and politeness. You know, I mean, if you're walking down the street and you see somebody weighing 569 pounds, you don't normally feel obliged to go up to the person and say, my God, you're disgustingly fat. <laughs> okay, it's, you might think it, but there's really no reason for you to say it. Yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't want to criminalize that. Okay, but on the other hand, we have ways of dealing with that. And so, much of our, most of our conduct is in fact, is, reg is regulated by informal social norms. And therefore, for example, to come back to the issue, say, of religious discussion, if I'm having a discussion with an adherent to another form of Christianity or indeed another religion altogether, I would normally do my best not to say something that they found rude or insulting, but not, but that can't include obviously my saying that I think that in those areas where their, their religion differs from mine, I think they're wrong. And the reason for that is very simple, because if I didn't, I wouldn't hold the religion I do. And of course, curiously, they would think exactly the same thing. Right? So this is intellectual coherence. 
right? Uh, but again, it, it means that normally speaking, you know, I wouldn't shout and roar at them. I, I don't say, oh, but you're all damned and all of the rest. I mean, you know, there's there are ways of behaving properly. And uh, and and but the problem with with the restrictions on free speech is that people it this tends to prevent, if you like, the discussion of issues which are important. So that in the end, if it take it to its logical conclusion, uh, you'd be you we'd, we'd more or less be confined to grunts, inarticulate grunts. The only thing that couldn't possibly offend anyone. <laughs> even, even there. Maybe may, and maybe even then, who knows? I don't know. I don't know. So, um, obviously, as I said before, there's been a lot of furore around Jordan Peterson and yeah. also Douglas Murray. Neither of those two are Christians and um, the emphasis on free speech that might be there uh, within Judaism or Christianity. Um, I'm just wondering, between Christians and Jews and, say, more secular people, well, it's pretty complicated, I suppose, with Peterson, do you think that there's um, much of a strong alliance there, especially more liberal, classical liberal types? And do you think, do you foresee that um, having legs into the future? Or do you think that's a, a temporary phenomenon and it'll sort of split again? Uh, I don't think this is primarily a religious issue in the sense, I mean, I think that people ha find themselves for various reasons, their upbringing, their training, their, their experience in the world, uh, discovering the foundational virtue, as it were, of free speech. And they can do this if they're Christians or Jews or Muslims or Confucians or Buddhists or none, right? And then there are many people who are religious believers who would actually be on the side of restricting free speech. So I'm very, I'm sure that very many of my co-religionists would be horrified by my views of mm -hmm. free speech. Whereas there are probably many of my non-co-religionists, in other words, or, or non-believers at all, with whom I would find common cause. So I think this is an issue that cuts across all of those uh, divisions. So this is a unifying element of the libertarian emphasis and Zero yeah, I, I think so. I mean, let, let, let's kind of roll the, the tape back for a second. I mean, when I say I'm a libertarian, what is that? It means I'm committed to the uh, implementation of the zero aggression principle. Is that, the, is that it? Is, is, that, is, that, is that the entirety of my worldview? And the answer is no, of course not. Right? It's a bit like saying, it's a bit like saying that somebody who thinks that water is a good thing to drink is suggesting that the only thing you should ever drink is water. <laughs> okay, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. It's a minimal condition. And when people say, oh, I could never be a libertarian, I say, well, reflect on what that means. Because the basic liber libertarian position is, as I said, the zero aggression principle, which is there's never a right to initiate or threaten to initiate aggression against another person or that person's property. If you reject that principle, what you're saying is you think that it is at least on some occasions right to initiate or threaten to initiate um, aggression against another person's property. Right? Uh, so this is not so this is not a case of resisting somebody else's aggression, which is perfectly in order because that's not initiating it. And I'm saying, well, if you accept that position, in other words, if you reject the non-aggression principle, the zero aggression principle, then you have no principal ground to stand on if others, if you like, are willing to initiate aggression against you when you are not engaging in aggression yourself. That's the problem. That's the price you are prepared to pay. Now, the, the problem here is that you see, people tend to see things from their own perspective. So those students, for example, who are in favor of prohibiting free speech, aren't necessarily in favor of prohibiting their own speech because they see themselves as being in the right, as having the right views and as controlling, if you like, the, the means by which other people can speak. But I, I would say to, I used to say to my students, but hang on a second, it wasn't that long ago that people with your views, at least some of your views, were in a position where they weren't able to speak freely. Right? And by the way, history being what it is, it may well be that in the future, near or long, it might happen again. And so if you're not prepared to accept the principle of free speech or the zero aggression principle and so on, how would you, how, what, how, 
How will you be able to resist, if you like, those who are aggressing against you? Because if you say you can't do that, and they say, well, you don't subscribe to the zero aggression principle. Mm -hmm. So you can't object to us, if you like, limiting your freedom and aggressing against you, even though you haven't yourself done anything aggressive. That's it. That's the heart and soul of it. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, of course, the whole of our life. I mean, all that does is, if you like, is set the broad parameters in which we operate our lives. And then, of course, we, offer, we associate freely with other people. We form families. We make commitments, communities. We have jobs. And we, all of that develops within, if you like, the very large area that's circumscribed by the zero aggression principle. So that sort of brings me nicely to your most recent book, then After Me Too. Uh, <laughs> So uh, yes. th those Twitter mobs, probably probably called, um, seem to ignore <laughs> what you just said. So I'm wondering, uh, basically, what do you think about the Me Too movement, or what you'd like to share, and why do you think it was such a seminal moment? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the, bio, uh, the Twitter, by the way, because I think that's highly significant. And I'll have something to say about social media in a moment, uh, because I think it's its effect, while there are many, many pluses, obviously, to it, not, not least the fact that we're communicating in this way uh, just now, there is, is a downside, and I'll talk about it in a second. So clearly, um, some individual men have behaved very badly towards some women in certain very restricted and limited context. Largely, for example, I mean, the, the um, Me Too movement was set off uh, in the entertainment world. It's a world that most of us don't know anything about and so on, uh, where people are moving and the movers and shakers, the filmmakers and so on and so forth. Um, and then the, the whole thing about Me Too was that everybody started chiming in saying, oh, yes, I'm, the, I'm being victimized in this way and so on. And so what, what we needed to do and what I tried to do in the book is I'm not, I'm not rejecting the idea, by the way, when I reject the Me Too movement, I'm not saying no woman has ever been offended against in this way. Of course, that's not, that's not so. But what I am saying is that this is not a, an essential feature of male-female relations. And indeed, it seems to be confined primarily to a very small group of people in a very limited number sort of, of industries. Um, and therefore, what we saw was a sort of hysterical reaction on the part of you know a lot of women and, and some of the some of the stories were obviously ridiculous so one one of the uh, one of the incidents i deal with uh, in the book is the what i call the sort of the uh, the sad case of aziz ansari i don't know if you know who he is have you ever watched parks and recreation but yeah. he played his played a character in that and so on so anyway he so an article was published in an, in, an, in an August journal called Babe, in which this woman called, who called herself Grace, said that going, she went out on a date with him and it was the worst night of her life. And when you go through this article, she doesn't give a real name, but he, she does give his real name. She describes in meretricious detail what went on in that evening, right? And it, it's, it's unpleasant and I didn't particularly appreciate having to kind of retell it, but the, here's the issue. <laughs> there was nothing stopping her at any stage from getting up and going home. <laughs> she wasn't being tied down. She wasn't being forced. There wasn't any gun to her head. And so it's hard to understand here why it is, if things were really as unpleasant as she said they were, why she actually didn't get up and go. And the same thing applies to many of the stories. So in the case of Harvey Weinstein, for example, you wonder why so many people who said they were subjected to his <laughs> what would seem to be bizarre behavior didn't actually get up and go. I think the answer is, and I don't mean to be crass about this, was that Harvey had jobs to give, roles to cast. And I, I suspect that if, if many of these people who complained about Harvey's behavior uh, after the event had been subjected to that behavior by somebody else who wasn't in that kind of position of power, Okay, they, they wouldn't have tolerated it. So in a sense, you're saying, didn't you, in a curious way, accept what was going on? Okay, uh, and isn't it a little late to complain about it now? Okay, and so the, 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 one of the big questions I raise here has to do 
with with uh, women's responsibility. I'm saying, you know, we have to women have to actually decide whether they want to be treated like adults, okay, so that they're responsible for what they do and what they don't do and what they put up with and what they don't put up with, or whether they are somehow psychic infants who must be protected at, at all costs from, from horrible people who were the child. So which is it, right? Are they strong and independent and to be treated like responsible human beings, or are they not? And one of the problems with the narratives here is they seem to flip from one to the other. They seem to go from one to the other. I'm going, listen, you can't have it every way. Yeah. So is let's get what serious. They call in the book, the feminist two-step? Yeah, the, the, yeah. There's, there's so many two-steps, it's unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you switch, It's like bait and switch, you go back and forth and so on. So yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not too sympathetic to many of the stories. I'm not saying there weren't some that are genuine as well. That's, that's probably true, but by and large, no. And of course, the, it has, in a way, um, even though Toby Young was kind enough to say on the flash, on the front cover of my book, that this book could not be more timely, in a way, a lot of the energy sort of drained out of the Me Too movement. It got a slight fill up again with the conviction of Harvey Weinstein about a month ago, uh, which is just about the time when my book came out. Uh, but I suspect that it'll be something like a virus, if you pardon the current reference, which will pop up again and again from time to time, but which will gradually sort of fade away. Mm -hmm. Now, to come back to the point I wanted to talk about, which has to do with social media. The point is this. I'll begin with, I'll begin with a short story. Oh, maybe 25 years ago or so, um, the Irish Times was running a series on various issues. And I happened to be in the Irish Times office in Dulier Street in Dublin. And I said to the chap who was looking after this, what kind of a reaction are you getting to this series? And he said, we had a brilliant reaction last week. I said, really? He said, yes, we got 10 letters. <laughs> now you think, what? 10 <laughs> letters? Well, well, this is obviously before the email and Twitter and, you know, WhatsApp and all of this stuff. And the number of people who said, oh, I, I feel really strongly about it, they're going to write a letter to the paper, never did. Most people thought about it and probably even thought they had, but they actually didn't do it. And the reason for that was that there was a cost. Yeah. There was an opportunity cost. First of all, most people didn't have typewriters and they didn't have word processing. So you actually had to get out your, your pen and your pad and draft your letter and maybe draft it two or three times and write it out with a fair hand and put it in an envelope and get a stamp or find the stamp and then take it to the post office and post it, <laughs> right? So what I'm saying is there's a cost to doing it, an upfront cost to doing it. And the, and the trouble, of course, with social media, it's effectively costless. So you see something online and you, know, you watch a YouTube video and you can comment instantly and you don't have to reflect on it. There used to be a rule, uh, sort of a, a practical rule of thumb, which is when you're writing a letter, you know, uh, when, you're really when you're really angered by something and you were writing a letter, it was to draft the letter, put it in an envelope and sit on it. Yeah. And the idea was that if you gave yourself some time your views have become more reflective and slightly more nuanced, yeah. okay? So that's the first thing is that it's effectively costless. Two, it's effectively almost universal because now everybody hears, whereas before news took a long time to filter out and by the time it got to you, it was old news. So even if you made a reaction and so on, it was too slow. So, so there wasn't this kind of amp this sudden explosion effect that you get on social media. Right? And so now we get this. So somebody says, says or does something and there's a Twitter storm. Suddenly there are like, I don't know, 120,000 or 30,000 people all yelling and screaming and so on and in less than whatever number of characters they deal with. One of my proudest moments, by the way, is never having thought Twitter was a good idea. <laughs> I am not on Twitter. Okay, I'm not on Facebook either. Although I was on for about a week and then I decided, no, this wasn't for me and I got off really quickly. Um, so you have all, it's, it's, it's effectively costless. And thirdly, it's anonymous by and large. And so you have the same sort of phenomena. People, people, people do things when they think they're anonymous that they will not do when they're not. 
And I'll give you, this is a vulgar example, but it's not too vulgar. One of the things people have noticed is that people sitting in traffic in motor cars pick their noses. It's as if being inside in the automobile, they can't be seen, right? yeah. Whereas they would never do it, okay, walking down the street, okay, or in company, okay? So when you take all of those things and put them together, you can see why you've got a costless, universal, instant, amplified, okay, anonymous uh, form of communication. And that has, if you like, distorted public communications. We haven't yet developed a, as it were, socially recognized means of regulating this kind of conduct. In other words, the social norms that I talked about earlier. So for example, when I'm, if I do something on YouTube, okay, I never read beyond the third or fourth comment. <laughs> and the reason is, it either goes becomes abusive or mad, or people start talking about other things and it wanders off into the <laughs> desert, right? So <laughs> you just, you know, and so, so when people complain about it being abused on social media, I go, what's the trouble with the switch on your phone? Or can you not turn it off? Or is somebody forcing you to read all these hostile comments? Why would you want to do that? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me. Anyway, we can talk about that all night. <laughs> That's enough on that rant. <laughs> so that kind of um, dovetails with your point about uh, not progress not being one dimensional, I guess, because yes. it's made these progresses in technology, but yet it's made us even more, I don't know, crazier than <laughs> we were before. Or it's it brought it to the fore, I guess. Like you're saying about those people uh, picking their nose, it just <laughs> allows you to vent out your craziness, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> speaking I, of I mean, I, I've had some sort of, I, I, I have to say by and large, because I don't, I'm not on social media, I've been protected from some of these insanities. But I'll give you a strange example. I, I play a lot of chess and I, I belong, uh, I'm subscribed to chess.com and play online. You can play anyone in the world, you know, the people are picked at random and, you know, normally at your own level and it's great, it's fine. And there's a little chat box down at the end if you want to exchange, say hello, Argentina or whatever. And um, so I was playing a guy from the UK one day and then I noticed I had a message. So not just on the chat box, but there's people can send you a message. So this person had lost to me. And the, the message says something like, you're just a lucky and then rude word, Irish, another rude word. And I thought, what? <laughs> like chess is, you know, I mean, chess is for nerds, right? So I, I replied and I said, uh, I'm a little bit surprised by what you said. I'm a believer in free speech, but I don't quite see what I did to merit this extremely rude, and I think when you reflect on it, unwarranted comment. I mean, you lost the game. I lose games all the time. I don't write abusive messages to people. And so he actually came back and apologized, which is extraordinary. You know what I mean? But this is, this is a strange sort of thing where I could imagine if I was on, you know, Twitter all the time, I'd probably be getting not just one of these once in my life, but, but 15 or 20 a day. So thank God for that, right? Thank God I made the decision to stay off. <laughs> social media. Anyway, that's enough. Okay, keyboard chess warriors, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've got to say it's the only time I experienced that. Wow. Um, There's an interesting uh, chapter in Me Too, about after Me Too, about chess too, which I'd refer other people to. Yeah, that's right. I wonder Crazy. If you yeah. Crazy what is going on with people in the chess world <laughs> as much as anywhere else. Oh yeah, apparently women are being forcibly excluded from participating and I go, oh, good grief. I can remember when I when I was young playing chess, you know, if we had a woman in a chess club, it was like she'd be treated like a princess because we were so delighted to have somebody there. Right? <laughs> and now you can play chess 24 hours a day online. You don't, nobody needs to know your sex. For example, it's not revealed. Uh, you can play, you know, oh, I wish I'd had the, the uh, facilities uh, for, you know, 50 years ago when I was starting to play chess. Then you go to a chess club, you get one game a week. Now I could play 15 blitz games in a day if I had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyway, there are. So I, I'm not, my heart does not bleed when it comes to women in chess. So uh, a few of your earlier works, then I'll refer back to 
one that I read there recently was Libertarian Anarchy Against the mm-hmm. State. Um, yeah. So it was really, that was a good book. I was wondering, mm-hmm. basically, um, this notion of Libertarian Anarchy, which speaks to your point about imagining outside the box, since we're so uh, socially conditioned to believe that the state is all knowing and all good these days. People find it very hard to imagine a stateless society. Would you give different practical examples from Eskimos to medieval Ireland to things like that? Yeah. But, um, at a at a grander level, if if that's the right way to phrase it, I was wondering how do you feel that this libertarian anarchy model would allow for greater human flourishing? It comes back to something I was talking about earlier when I was saying about my students how my course was designed to challenge them to accept responsibility for what they thought, um, and and so I'm a great believer that people not only should, for reasons of other people leaving them alone, but more importantly for reasons of development, accept responsibility for their own lives, for the lives of their families and their communities and so on, but freely. Okay? And I believe, you see, when people say, when I say I'm an anarchist, they think, oh, you're, you're in favor of disorder and chaos, which is the vulgar meaning of, of anarchy. But of course I'm not. I mean, generally speaking, see me without a tie tonight, but I normally have a tie and I'm the anarchist who wears a tie. What kind of anarchist are you? And I, but I'm all in favor of order. I just think that order, the order that's really valuable comes from the ground up. It comes from the way in which we organize ourselves for our own purposes and the rules we voluntarily subscribe to that circumscribe our conduct. Um, and those are vitally important. I, I mean, there may be libertarians out there and anarchists out there who think the ideal life is lived, I don't know, in the middle of a wood somewhere where you shoot squirrels, skin them and eat them. That's not my kind of life. I'm, I'm a city boy. I mean, the first thing I want when I wake up in the morning is a good whiff of carbon monoxide, okay, to get my blood moving. <laughs> okay. So yeah, it's um, so libertarian. So libertarianism, if you like, is freedom. But people can use or abuse freedom. But if they don't have freedom, they can't either use it or abuse it. And if so, the cost, if you like, of not giving people freedom, the benefit is they can't abuse it. But then you're the one setting the rules, and who know? And why should you think you know what's best for everybody? But but more importantly, it actually infantilizes people. It it treats them as if they're children all of their lives. And while as children, of course, we need our parents and we need our guardians and we need other people to take responsibility for us. No parent, for example, no sensible parent wants his children to be children forever. However beautiful and wonderful your children will be when they were small and they're young they grow up and your job as a parent is as it were to let go of your children so that they can accept responsibility for themselves right so while it's so i'll give you an example while it's perfectly in order for example to grab your two-year-old's hand as you cross the road and if he tries to shake it off you just don't let go say sorry kid okay if he says but i'm a libertarian dad you say tough okay you're crossing the road with me okay because you're not you're not big enough and old enough to take responsibility for your elections yet. But if your son is 22, okay, I think he might be able to cross the road in his own. Yeah. That's the difference. So my approach to politics is the same way. Politics should be organized so that people organize themselves and take responsibility. And it doesn't prevent cooperation. In fact, I'm all in favor of cooperation uh, and, 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 how, and so on. I mean, in spreading the costs of doing things. For example, why would you want to live in a way where you have to like grow your own food and shoot your own game and draw your own water and do all of these things yourself. The whole point is we share all of these things around and other people do things for us and we exchange our goods and services. Great, terrific, I'm all for that. And uh, so in our world, in my libertarian world, all of that continues. What we don't have, however, are a lot of people who for some reason think that they're blessed with some kind of divine gift where they know what's better for us than we do ourselves and are happy, here's the point, there may well be people like that even in a libertarian world, but in a libertarian world, they don't have the power or the capacity to force us to do things. Yeah. That's the difference. Unfortunately, that is the case right now. And we're seeing it vividly, by the way, in the current crisis. So the, my takeaway from that is that um, libertarian anarchy accounts better for fallen human nature and 
the unintended consequences I think that come about often through those um, state initiatives with, with the best will in the world, the, the unintended consequences tend to be dire, it seems, and especially yeah. whenever it's led by those kind of people with unconstrained visions, as Tom so calls it, that you just... Oh, yeah, glad you brought that up. That's a good one. It, it is kind of curious. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan said the 10 most feared, feared words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, no, it is strange. Um, and I, I, again, if I can just tell another anecdote, you can't stop me. But uh, <laughs> I can remember watching, I remember watching a film version of Kidnap, uh, the Robert Louis Stevenson story. It said at the time of the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion. And uh, Michael Caine actually plays a, a Scotch Jacobite. And in one scene, uh, while he's on the run, he, if I remember rightly, he's on the kind of hillside on the moor uh, overlooking it with his, with his long-suffering girlfriend, fiance, whatever it is. And, and she's telling him, you know, basically get a grip on yourself. Uh, and he's saying, but I would die for Scotland. And she said, like, who wants you to? <laughs> <laughs> so there are people out there who are desperate to do things for me and to help me. And my thing is, that's very nice of you, but I don't want you to. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Right. So it, it, it's a curious state of mind to think that somehow you, you know better than other people what's good for them. Right? And, and you're prepared to actually force them to accept your vision of what's good for them. Mm -hmm. Really strange. Politicians are a strange bunch. <laughs> and somebody once said, "Once said, make your polit make your politician work, don't elect them." <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you uh, suggest then that anyone who is interested in say libertarian anarchy or even minarchy, what sort of first steps, practical first steps, can we take to go down that road? Since we've been so mm -hmm trained to believe that we need to go first to the government and second to the government and well first of all re to realize that you're not alone and this is one of the advantages by the way of social media there are, we talked about the downside a little earlier but there are plus sides so before i mean like again if i could take a personal example i grew up in cork city in the 1950s there was a local library city library that was the only access that i had to anything you know, there, there, there was obviously no uh, internet and so on, and television was entertainment such as it was, one channel in, in, in my case. And so if I wanted to know anything, the only way I could do to find out anything was by going to the library. Well, I was obviously constrained by the number and kind of books that they had. Now, with you've got the world at your fingertips. Now there's a downside to it because there's a lot of craziness, obviously, on the internet. But if you're interested in libertarianism, you can find your way very quickly to sensible and reliable sources. And indeed, uh, when I, even back in the 2000s and whatever it was, four or five, when I became a libertarian explicitly, within a very short space of time, I found my way, for example, to the Mises Institute uh, in Alabama. And that's, they got like, oh, there is so much material. I mean, articles and book reviews and full, PDFs of books. I mean, you, you're better equipped here than, than the best equipped library would have been in my youth. So you can find all of these things. And then you can, again, if you're, if, if unlike me, you're actually on Twitter or Facebook and so on, you can find other people okay, who think like you in this one and who can sort of bring you along. There are advantages, if you like, to, think, to being with people of like mind, uh, you know, for some, for, for some period of time, provided you don't simply cocoon yourself away forever but if you're but there are so many people who are opposed to libertarianism that even if you associate with libertarians from time to time you get plenty of other some things coming at you from the other side you're not likely to be shielded or confirmed, especially <laughs> if you if you take a stand on it and come out and uh, you know write or publish or start a youtube channel or even do an interview and so on you get plenty. so you learn very very quickly so that's that's all i can say is um you know start anywhere it's like the pick up any piece of thread and it'll lead you, you know, to uh, rich resources. There's tons of material there. And then follow your interests. Yep.
I know I came across your work through Tom Woods' show, and I'm very grateful, at least that he is on Twitter and very <laughs> vocal on Twitter at that, but he, he's serving the cause well. And I'm glad that he introduced me to your work and anybody that would like to follow up this with further videos with you and Tom, there's a number of them on there still. Yes, on Costa really. Yeah. The only good thing I can say about those is I look younger. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you don't mind for time, are you okay for time? I'm not, I'm not even, I wasn't even, well, you can do another little, but why don't go for another one? Okay, so, sounds good. So I would like to go take it back to your earlier work. So I believe it was in 1993, you were writing about pro-life movement at the legal level. Is that right? Or around the early 90s? No, it was a bit later. Uh, well, I might have done, gosh, you know, I can't, Mark, I honestly can't say, um, I probably did do some writing, but I didn't do anything really concentrated. Uh, until the turn of the millennium. Okay. So and what happened was I, I took I did a, I took a law degree in London and some issues came up there which piqued my curiosity and I I did some more research and I published a book in 2005 called Born Alive, which was a treatment of a specific issue in the uh, common law in the English common law tradition, but I contextualized it in the larger question about abortion and its justification. So that was my kind of, that was where my kind of work culminated. I obviously have participated in pro-life movements and so on, but I have to say, with all frankness, I'm, I'm a spirit carrier there. I haven't led anything. It's, you know, turning up every now and then, going to talks, making contributions and so on. So I, I, I'm full of admiration for those people who are, who are like carrying the, the fight as it were out on a day-to-day -day basis, especially. It's, such, it's so unpopular. My phone gone off. Okay, sorry about that. And so, um, regarding the pro-life movement, I think it's an interesting one from a libertarian anarchist perspective, yep. because the way the issue is framed seems to be about um, my body, my choice, and you're oppressing upon women, or you're as if you're aggressively attacking women. Is what some of the rhetoric I've seen? Um, I'm just wondering, with that in mind. What sort of struggles have you come across? I'm sure people, pro-lifers are coming across a lot of hostility. I've experienced some of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, it's, it's actually, for a libertarian, there's a little bit of tension here and maybe I could explain what that is. So first of all, um, a libertarian would say that you have a perfect right to do, legally speaking that is, I'm not speaking morally, okay, legally, to do whatever you want to your own body. Okay, it may not be advisable, I might think it's idiotic, uh, persuade you uh, to try and not do it, but in the end, you've, you have a perfect right to do it. So under normal circumstances, I mean, if you wanted to cut off your leg, okay, let's say, um, I would say, Mark, are you crazy? Please don't do that, okay? <laughs> but in the end, you know, if you want to buy a new saw and go off into the woods somewhere and cut your leg off, <laughs> it's your leg, right? Okay, okay. Now, in the in the normal order of things, one human being is not biologically dependent upon another. Right? You can be socially dependent. Children are socially dependent upon their parents, for example. But pregnancy, which is in many ways one of the commonest things in the world, we all came we're all the result of pregnancies ourselves, uh, is unique in this sense that it's the only naturally occurring situation in which one human being is biologically dependent on another. Now, the issue only arises, so for example, for those people who say that the, the product of conception from the moment of conception until the time of birth isn't a human being, then I think they're wrong, of course, but there wouldn't be an issue because they would be saying, well, if this is a part of my body. And just as somebody can have their appendix out if they choose without it being, if you like, a constitutional matter and so on, uh, so it would be with abortion. But I think at this stage, it's really hard, argued, given our understanding of embryology and the development of the fetus and so on, that what we haven't, that what we've got in a woman's womb from the start is a human being from start to finish. It's, it's not... It's in the mother's body, but it's not part of the mother's body in the way that 
her liver or spleen or heart is. And indeed, under normal circumstances, it will cease to be within the woman in the period of nine months and become its own, uh, if you like, independent living outside the womb being. So the problem then is how, how do we deal with a situation where a woman is pregnant and doesn't want to be? And so one strain of libertarianism would say, well, we could regard the child as a trespasser. Okay, and on the analogy, say that say you have land and somebody comes onto your land, you don't want them to be there. You don't give them permission, they're trespassers. Right? And they would say, well, therefore you have, you have the right to uh, get a trespasser to leave your property. And therefore, while a pregnant woman wouldn't have the right to kill the child in the womb directly, she would have the right to, as it were, evict it. Right? And if it died as the result of eviction, then that's too bad. That more or less is the position that Murray Rothbard takes, and indeed uh, others as well. But there's another strand of thought, and you'll find, as anyone who's interested, can look up Libertarians for Life online, and they'll find this material. And so this is how uh, their argument goes. All right, so let's go back to the idea of for kind of physical trespass on your property. If some human being comes onto your property and you don't want them, to be there. Are you entitled to take out an AK-47 and just shoot them dead on the spot? And the answer is normally no, <laughs> right? That's, that, that reaction is disproportionate. What you should do ideally is to go to them and say, look, uh, you're trespassing on my property. I don't want you here, please leave. And most people would say, whoops, I didn't realize, I'm sorry. And you know, show me the shortest way out to uh, the roadway or whatever. And even if somebody said, oh, well, I don't care. I'm, I'm a great believer in free rambling or something. I'm going to stay here. You would, are you now entitled to take out your AK-47 and shoot them? And the answer is no, right? Again, that would be disproportionate to the, as it were, the offense. What you are entitled to do is to hire four burly guys who would then pick your trespasser up and take them off and put them outside your property. Now, let me give you another analogy where this might seem to break down. Suppose you were kidnapped. Obviously against your will, you can hardly be kidnapped willingly. Okay, and you were placed on board an airplane and in a drug state. And um, the airplane took off. And when you were flying up, whatever it is, 35,000 feet, the captain of the airplane, you, 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 you come to and start making noises and the captain of the airplane discovers that you're there. Now, you have no right to be on that plane. It's not your plane. But remember, you didn't choose to be there. You didn't voluntarily trespass. You were, as it were, put there despite your intentions, okay? And in fact, you would much rather be down somewhere having a cup of coffee with a friend right now. So you don't want to be there. And, and so you explain your situation, say, I, I was, all I knew was having a cup of coffee and the next minute I know I wake up and I'm on board this plane. And the captain says, well, I'm afraid you, you, know, you can't stay on my plane. And you go, fine with me, not a problem, okay? And you can, you know, land somewhere, I'll get off wherever it might be, land in the field even if it comes to that, and I'll get off or give me a parachute and I'll, I'll head down if you really are des that desperate. And the guy goes, no, 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 no. I, I don't want you on my plane and I'm, I'm not, I want you off now. And you go, well, where's the parachute? And he goes, no, no parachute. So you're saying, I'm sorry, like, I, I, <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong to get here, okay? I. I'm, I'm, I'm as much wronged as you are, right? Um, what, while I would prefer not to be on your plane and you would prefer me not to be on your plane, what awful harm am I just by my almost certain death by having to jump out of your plane at 35,000 feet? So the Libertarians for Life kind of take an argument of that kind, which is to say, yes, that's true, 
but there is a question of proportionality. And it's interesting, by the way, that even people like Rothbard, when they're discussing ordinary cases of trespass, recognize a principle of proportionality. So I think it's, I think it's Rothbard's example at somewhere, I, I can't swear to it now because I may have, it may be something I've made up myself and thought it was in Rothbard, but let's assume that I'm correct. And he says something like, suppose you're, you're, a street, you're, you're, you're one of these people who sells uh, apples from a cart on the street. And these little, these, these little street urchins who are around the place, you know, annoying, all, you know, running up every now and then and, you know, taking an apple from your cart and running off with it. Right. Now, that's annoying. And in fact, it's an act of theft, but it's not really like causing you poverty and so on. And as much as you dislike it, once again, and much, and much as you'd like to stop it, your method of stopping it has to be proportionate to the harm that's likely to be done or is being done to you. So again, once taking out the AK-47, okay, is not justified in those circumstances. <laughs> so I think something like that. So I, there is a tension. Okay, I freely admit it, uh, because of the peculiar circumstances, as it were, because of the biological dependency of one human being on the other. But when you take all of those things together, even given my libertarian instincts, here, I think that the question of proportionality in the removal of, uh, using the language of, of Rothbard, which I don't normally accept, but for, just for the sake of argument, the language of trespasser here would not justify uh, abortion. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that fully answered your question or would satisfy anybody who hears this, but that's my view. Uh, thank you for that. Um, also then, I would like to just ask about any future work that you would be interested in writing about. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel moved in any particular direction? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, the two books I've just published, the one on free speech, Zap, and the After Me Too are two books which have come out from a single sort of research project, which began in 2017. I have one more book that I'm planning. It's always dangerous to talk about plans because sometimes they don't come to fruition. But I have one book that I'm working on at the moment, a third one, which is on the transgender issue. And this, if I complete and publish this, this will be the final part of that research project. And when that's done, if I actually carry it through, because I spent most of December of last year and January and February of this year going, will I, won't I, will I, won't I? And at the moment I'm on a will I, yes. Okay, but that could be no tomorrow. So anyway, uh, if I carry that through, that will be the end of this current project. And then, God willing, I'm going to go back to where I started in philosophy, back to philosophy, religion, apologetics, um, philosophical theology. That's where I would want to go. Excellent. And, uh, and I have some ideas for what I'd like to do in that. Um, what, the principal thing I would like to do in that is, if I can explain it, is as follows. Are you familiar with the name Frank Sheed? Does that mean anything to you? Yes. Um, Catholic um, author from the States. Is that right? From the 1920s, 30s, and so on. Yeah, Sheed, Sheed uh, of Sheed and Board, by the way, the publishing company. Frank Sheed had a thing called the Catholic Evidence Training Guild. Yeah, I have it here. Actually, as it turns out, look at this. And they they engage in public speaking in um, places like Hyde Park and in Central Park in the uh, in New York. Yeah. And um, so he. In the late 1960s, he was interviewed. He brought out a new version of this called Faith Comes by Hearing. And he was asked, what's the difference between then and now? And he said, then, if I got up in um, you know, Hyde Park and started talking about anything Catholic, I would be guaranteed an audience. 25 or 30 people would go around and they would shout at me and they would say, you Catholics worship Mary. And they would, you know, they would shout objections and so on. And, but, and they would heckle and they would argue and so on. Now, he said, I could stand up and say, I think that there are 17 persons in God and nobody would bat an eyelid. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, so the difference between then and now is this. 
because of the change in culture and knowledge and history and personal experience and a whole host of other things, you cannot assume that if you start addressing the, the substantive questions directly, that you will have an audience. And the reason for this is to use the, the distinction drawn by another, uh, by William James, is there's a distinction between live questions and dead questions. A live question is a question that the answer to which matters to you existentially. It's going to make a difference to how you live your life. Very often when students are in college, most of the questions they discuss are dead questions. It, it involves simply moving conceptual counters around in various ways and learning how to do it. Right. So the problem then is, as I see it, the, 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 the real issue, or at least one very important issue for people who are interested in philosophy, religion, or apologetics is how do you make the question live before ever you get to start to supplying particular answers before you know so on? Because that's a second stage that didn't, you know, she didn't have to do that in the 1920s, but we have to do that now because for most of uh, most of students today, most young people today, those questions, which for people of my, even of my generation, were life questions. In other words, not believing in God, I was an atheist for 15 years, was a serious matter. It wasn't something you just kind of drifted into. It wasn't something you simply absorbed from the zeitgeist. It was something you thought about, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I was right to do what I did or to think as I did and so on. In fact, I wasn't, but, but there, at least I was serious about it, yeah. okay? And when the opportunities arose to reconsider those questions, those were still life questions for me, okay? And, and, and were such that I came back to the faith in a different way, this time, like my students, making it my own, mm -hmm. okay? And not something which was simply imposed on me. Um, so I would like to use my knowledge of rhetoric, which is the, the art and science of persuasion, to try and, and see how we can go about finding ways in which we can make those kinds of questions live so that people are existentially engaged so that then the rest of the material can be brought to their attention. What happens after that, of course, is between them and, and God. That's another story. Um, you know, so anyway, that's it, really. That makes sense. Uh, my friend, Matt, actually, he does YouTube videos, analyzing different movies online. And mm -hmm. um, parts of his advice to me were identifying those key questions that, that will draw people in because they're not going to be automatically in interested. In, he looks at theological themes through film. So he'll look at um, the Shawshank Redemption, Christological themes in that movie, and a whole ream of movies. But uh, you have to oh. sort of meet people where they are, I suppose. Like what yeah, saying. no, absolutely. I mean, you know, like I, I'm, f I'm fascinated by, uh, say, the central doctrines of Christianity, the Trinity of God, the tripersonhood, as it were, and the two natures of Christ, and the issues that are raised philosophically. Those are a source of endless fascination yeah. for me. But my guess is, for somebody who's actually not a believer, those are about as interesting as discussing the intricacies of <laughs> Buddhist metaphysics. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, maybe for an idle hour, but it doesn't mean anything to me. Who cares how it comes out? It doesn't really matter. So the, the before ever you get, I'm not saying these things aren't important. I think they are. I think they're important and interesting, but there, you can't start there. Yeah. Think, that's a long way. That's a long way down the road. I look forward to that because I see from what you're doing in political philosophy, that hard work of translation that's required from the more abstract, meaty philosophical issues and law, I know your background in law as well, that, that t must take a lot of work and we can only commend you for that hard work of translating that to a popular audience. Uh, that came across well, with the, the After Me Too book as well which yeah. you've written in a whimsical style and you know, <laughs> rhetorical flourish is there. So, well, I, I, I've, I've learned this. I've learned, I've, you know, I should be, I'm old enough. But when I, when, I, when I was at my retirement party, I thanked my students for teaching me how to teach. And I apologized to the students from my early years for having been so awfully dull and boring. 
<laughs> I have so, this uh, thing, same, uh, what would you call it, issue from primary school teaching because I have to obviously break it down to a nice digestible level. Yeah, see, you, you will know here, well, what's the task of a teacher? Well, you can relay information, but they can get information from a book and so on. The, the core, the art of teaching, it seems to me, is this. When a student doesn't understand, you have to be able to understand why the student doesn't understand and to remove the blockage. Mm -hmm. And that takes skill. You actually have to go, as it were, out of yourself into the student's mind to try to see the problem from the student's and understand what that is. And then there's no point just repeating the information. If they'd understood it the first time, if they didn't understand it the first time, they're unlikely to understand it the second time. So it's to find a way of doing that. And very often it's by examples. In fact, Thomas Aquinas once said, what's the difference between a really bright student and one that's not so bright? And the answer is the really bright students only need one example. Right? So other students, so the, the teaching if, if it's more than just relaying information, what's the added value of the teacher? Because they can get information from all sorts of sources. Mm -hmm. it's, to, it's to remove those blocks so the student can come to see for him or herself what the truth is, and then to do it in some kind of organized way to save them the labor of doing it so that they can move faster to assimilate the information and to make it, and then to internalize it and to appropriate it properly. That's, that's your job. And, it's 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 not a science, but it is an art. Mm -hmm. right. I got to the stage once where a guy bit thought logic for what seemed like 165 million years, but, <laughs> but that's something. You can't. But anyway, at one stage in my teaching career, I got to the stage where I simply couldn't understand why the students couldn't understand what I was saying. It was so bleeding obvious to me. And I got impatient. And I, I was getting to the stage where I would simply repeat what I had said. And of course, they didn't understand it any better the second time than they did the first time. And I actually had to stop teaching logic for a number of years until such time as I could recover the ability, as it were, to understand why the students didn't understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there we are. That's the thing about teaching. Um, I would like to actually just go back, if you don't mind, to you said you're an atheist for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So obviously now you're a devout Catholic. I'm wondering what was the turning point for you? Or... You must never describe me as a devout Catholic. The only people who are described as devout Catholics are people who are actually on the brink of heresy. <laughs> 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 okay, or schism. It's always in the paper when somebody says something rude about the Pope or Bishop. So, no, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm your run-of-the-mill, ordinary Catholic. I'm a sinner like anybody else, struggling, okay, to keep my life in conformity with the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and sometimes succeeding, sometimes not, always needing help, always needing a lifeline, okay, and always saying when, when, when the host is elevated at Mass, I always say my Lord and my God, and the second thing I say is, I believe, help my unbelief, <laughs> always. But anyway, sorry, sorry, I, I, your question was what? How did I get from one place to the other? Convert or what uh, reconverted you, apart from Christ himself, but how did he do it, so to speak? Uh, well, he did it the way he does most things through other people, <laughs> okay, which is normally what he does. You know, he doesn't send a, a lifeboat down and he doesn't sort of appear to you on the side of a gable wall of a house or whatever he normally uses other people to do it in fact if anybody who's interested they can go to the program um the journey home on ewdn I, d I made a recording of this um so i don't know when it was but if they look it up presumably they can find it somewhere on the ewtn website so they can see me talking to marcus Godai for an hour on this but i'll give you the short version so i mean i, I gave up my faith in my in my teens like many another young man i, I don't know uh I had questions and, and there were some intellectual issues. There were probably moral issues as well. They, they, those actually are significant. But um, I, I started reading and I thought, this is nonsense. And some people who should have been in a position to enlighten me and to engage me and challenge me didn't seem to know much more about it than I did. And, and I thought, this is just nonsense. I don't believe any. So I rejected it. And at that time, 
being not being a believer in Ireland was a big deal. And I came under a lot of pressure to conform and I wouldn't do it. I wasn't going up and down with a with a with a sign saying, you know, down with the Pope or okay, no Catholics here or whatever. But I, I, I wouldn't go to mass just to please anybody because A, I thought it was hypocritical. And by the way, I also thought it was disrespectful to those who did, right? So I wasn't doing any of that. So that was how things were for quite a while. And, and I took up the study of philosophy and I did my degree. And then I ended up going to uh, America at the University of Notre Dame. And the first thing I discovered when I got there was that most of my fellow graduate students um, were Christians. <laughs> uh, not many Catholics, but almost all Christians and all believers. I mean, real believers. And that was a real shock to me because I thought religious believers were stupid. <laughs> and these were all obviously intelligent people. And uh, they believed, that, oh, that was the first kind of existential job. And we had discussions on and off for quite a number of years. And I learned a lot about Christianity as it were from the outside. You know, as I said, as if I was learning about Hinduism or Buddhism and so on. And then I was challenged by one of these people one night uh, to know why I wasn't a Christian. And then then the, the issue I talked about earlier between live and dead questions came into play. These questions had been dead for a long while, but the circumstances of my life had changed so that when this question was put to me, it was a live question. And I suddenly realized I was holding the end of it, of a, as it were, an electric wire that's being plugged in and I needed to do something about it. And then I had to think furiously and read and, and discuss and so on. And then I had an experience, again, I won't go to it here, which kind of brought me to the place where I had to make a sort of decision and again I was aware that I was being guided or wasn't being forced and that I could resist if I wanted to and that even the, the issues which weren't fully resolved were such that I could happily continue thinking about them for the next 150 years and they still wouldn't be resolved but that a decision had to be as it were made and I made that decision and and sometimes when I'm so I don't describe myself as a devout Catholic I describe myself as a grumpy Catholic. <laughs> and I'm grumpy because in many ways, I would much prefer not to be one. Okay? I, I'm, I, I wasn't particularly happy about it then, and I'm still not particularly happy about it. But I feel, I feel like St. Peter when, when and John 6, when he spoke about, I'm the bread of life, he, and so on. And many of his followers, disciples said, this is a hard saying, who can accept this? And they walked. And he said to Peter, will you too leave me? And, and Peter said, well, where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. So I feel like that. I mean, you know, for like, if, if, if I wish it were the case that I could kind of flip somewhere else and wander off somewhere else and go on, but I'm, I'm afraid the church uh, is a bit like my family. I'm kind of stuck with it and it's stuck with me. Okay, and we've got to get on as best we can. So I'm a grumpy Catholic. The next time you're describing me as a Catholic, make sure you call me a grumpy Catholic. <laughs> oh, I feel the same way. And um, it reminds me of a line in the Bob Dylan song about a new exit playing on Sartre. He's like, there's no exit except the one that can't be seen, you know? Like, yeah. like that's, yeah. the, that's the conclusion I've come to myself too. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Anyway, <laughs> there we go. Just finishing <laughs> up then, because I don't want to take up too much of your time. I would like to ask you about um, your legacy, if that's not too oh, pretentious a word. I feel really old, okay. Um, At a personal legacy. level and an academic level, what would you like your legacy to be? Well, at the personal level, there's no, that's not a big, in my personal level, uh, a legacy of my children. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my contribution to the world, as it were. And uh, somebody once said to me, look, they're, they're all employed and none of them is in jail. So you can count that as a success. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think that was setting the bar a bit low, but nonetheless, I, I think that's probably right. So yeah, the, so on a personal level, that's my legacy. Um, other than that, uh, you know, I've, I've written what I've written. My, my, what I've written will survive. How much of it will be relevant ever in the future? I mean, history, you know, one of the things that really, if you really want to get depressed, wander into a library and you will see there the collected works of Professor Spinkelbaum or somebody like this from Germany published over a lifetime of work, all 27 volumes sitting there unread, unread for the last 40, 50 years, taken out once in 1927, never yeah. before, never since. And you think this person, that's his whole life's work. It's there and just 
So I have no control over that. Okay, I, I can only do what I think I must do, do it as best I can, and then cast my bread on the waters and away it goes. And if some of it survives and helps somebody or amuses somebody or infuriates somebody or whatever, then I've done my job. Other than that, there's not much more that I can do. Well, it certainly happen me, and hopefully with videos like this, it'll help some other people too. I um, will try and link some of your works in the description notes and a few references to the pro-life libertarians and uh, yeah, the, don't forget don't forget uh, libertarians for life especially yeah libertarians for life and uh, thank you very much for your time dr casey it's Mark. been a pleasure to talk to you it's been a pleasure to talk to you